Hello and welcome. My name is Aaron Schachter. I'm also assignment editor at PRI's The World. I'm their former Middle East correspondent as well. So I've been to a lot of the countries we'll be talking about today. Today's program is an hour-long look um, at the refugee crisis. It's a collaboration of the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and PRI's The World and WGBH Radio here in Boston. As we've seen on the news, a staggering number of refugees and migrants are now streaming into Europe. Uh, the United Nations has described it as the biggest refugee and migration crisis since World War II. Our, our event today will look at a lot of aspects of what's going on. Who is entering into Europe now? What is driving them? How is Europe and the rest of the world coping? What we should do? And what are the humanitarian and public health implications of this crisis, this ever-increasing crisis. Today's panelists, starting from my immediate right, are Carl Kaiser. He directs the program on transatlantic relations at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, also at Harvard University. Jennifer Leaning is a professor of the practice of health and human rights here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and she's also co-founder of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Uh, Jacqueline Baba directs uh, research at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. And the gentleman we see on the screen is uh, Simon Henshaw. He's the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration with uh, the U.S. State Department. We will have a, a brief period of Q&A at the end. We hope to get to uh, as many questions as possible. And, and we will start with questions that are sent in to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. So if you're, you're watching us now online, send in those questions. Uh, you can also participate in a live chat that's happening on the forum site right now. And we will start uh, with Carl, who was recently in uh, Germany, which is now uh, kind of the promised land uh, for refugees and um, migrants. Y y you saw what was happening there firsthand. Um, Give us an idea of what is going on on the ground there. Well, we are witnessing a crisis of uh, historic proportions. I think that has been said by the UN quite rightly, because people, millions actually, who suffer in the crisis areas in the Middle East, West Asia, and Africa, decide no longer to stay where they are. And they flock in, a, in an exodus <laughs> of almost biblical proportions to Europe. And Europe, in particular Germany, is profoundly affected. And uh, earlier in September, the German government, Angela Merkel, the chancellor, and also the social democratic partner, who were reacting to this appalling incident in Hungary, um, they said, we'll suspend the rules. Uh, let them come in. Then the figure of 800,000 was mentioned. Well, in the meantime, in September alone, about 300,000 came in. In October, November, December, another 900,000 will come in. There is now, in the weekend, a paper by the government was leaked. Anywhere between 1.2 to 1.5 million will come in this year. Last year, there were less than in one month. Um, the conditions uh, at the local level are very, very difficult. Boston has a partner city, which is Hamburg, very comparable in size. Uh, they took in 30,000. Every day, four or five hundred arrive. Hamburg, like a number of other German cities, they have changed their local laws to requisition public buildings that are not used, or private buildings, halls. Fairgrounds are now being used. You have big halls with 500 people, with cots, mothers, children, husbands, young men, all together, Muslims, non-Muslims. They're all traumatized, they're all exhausted, they all have to be taken care of. The local structure is under enormous stress, despite hundreds of thousands of volunteers, and without them it would not have worked. And Chancellor Merkel, bless her, on Sunday, although she's heavily criticized from the right, and even from some social democrats, said, was the right decision? We'll, I'll stick to it, we must make it. Her popularity has gone down. The right wing, of course, is, is, uh, is encouraged by this. And we are now in a situation, um, I talked to some friends this morning in Berlin, they're getting very, very nervous. 
10,000 every day, every day, um, what does one do? The pull factor continues. Hundreds of thousands will come. The capability is at the limit. What then? And that is where Germany is and all the other European countries are watching. Uh, and it may very well be that the system as we have devised it, the, the Convention on Refugees, may not continue to work as it has in the past. Well, as many have said, um, Germany obviously is bearing the brunt, but this is not just uh, a European problem. Um, America needs to get involved as well. Simon, does it not? America's been involved since the beginning of the crisis. I think we need to remember that this isn't just a European refugee and migrant crisis. This is a crisis that's been going on since the Syria conflict began. The United States has been working with the countries surrounding Syria and actually inside Syria itself for more than three years. We've supplied $4.5 billion in aid. Um, half of that has gone inside Syria. I, I, I think we need to work very closely with our European colleagues. We are doing that on this crisis. We've called for a co comprehensive and coordinated response. Uh, the people that are coming to Europe need to be safe. They need to be treated with respect. They need to be treated uh, as refugees when they are refugees. But we can't take our focus away from the Middle East. First of all, we need to work to do everything we can to solve the political crisis there. And secondly, uh, we need to do everything to help the 8 million displaced inside Syria and the 4 million refugees in the surrounding area so that uh, they can have decent, safe uh, lives. Uh, we've probably seen uh, pictures on, on the television of, of what's going on. There, there have been some um, spots that have been especially hard hit um, by the influx of refugees. Um, we have a video now from the uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees about one particular spot. A gate closed, a journey blocked. This was Horgos on the Serb-Hungarian border. The Hungarians were allowing very few refugees or migrants to enter their country. These people had already traveled hundreds of kilometers, had risked their lives in the Mediterranean. Now they looked for another route into Europe, a route through neighboring Croatia. Thousands of others had arrived in Tovarnik, just inside Croatia, in the previous 24 hours. They waited, spent and frustrated, hours in the sun, for trains to take them further into Croatia. The police worked hard to keep order. Volunteers handed out water and food. Ayman, a Syrian, was grateful for the help. It's uh, the mass of different for me, without, without uh, my family. Okay. Well, my family in Syria, in, in the war, uh, uh, the, good, the good is here, the policeman help us. Finally, buses to take the waiting people further. Families with children were allowed on first. But hundreds pressed forward, pushing and shoving, fearful that they would be left behind. Croatian police tried to stem the flow. They failed. The crowd surged past them, through them. In Croatia, at the end of the day, they marched on, hoping one day soon to reach the rest of the European Union. So as we can see, this is not, not an easy problem to tackle, and, and different countries are dealing with it in different ways. That was Croatia. Hungary, as we know, has uh, done a, a very different thing. Um, Jennifer Leaning, uh, is, is someone to blame for all this? <clears throat> I, I think there is collective responsibility for um, that picture and whatever picture you might take, a snapshot in Germany, in Croatia, at Lesbos and Greek Island. Uh, what uh, a number of us are concerned about is that we're seeing the collapse of the humanitarian architecture that was set up after World War II. <clears throat> a refugee convention, 
a United Nations that would establish peace and international security, humanitarian NGOs, and the International Committee of the Red Cross who would deliver relief assistance. Uh, it's even a collapse of the development structure where there would be sufficient aid and advice and professional um, support for governments that were emerging or had um, issues within their own borders to become stronger and be better at providing safety and resources and livelihoods for their own citizens. None of that is working at a pace that people can now support. And in addition, we have had an outbreak, particularly in the last 15 years, and most pointedly in the last five, of some very serious wars in the Mideast that have not abided by any of the norms of war in terms of protecting civilians, that's the Geneva Conventions, um, or in terms of protecting humanita humanitarian aid workers, local ones or international ones, who come with support and supplies to shore up the population that has been wounded or is sick or needs food or water or shelter. UN aid convoys, convoys have been blocked by the Syrian government. Uh, so the internally displaced, as we reference, there are now about 8 million internally di displaced within Syria. Syria has half its population either internally displaced or refugees outside the country. Uh, if you <clears throat> think that those 8 million, by being internally displaced, are being taken care of by the UN, um, that's not correct because the UN has terrible difficulty getting there. Bombs, guards, landmines, um, and hostile militia within the country are preventing the international community from coming in. There are a few brave NGOs that are still trying to get their international NGOs, but in general, they are training and provisioning the local people, local physicians and nurses and others who are taking care of the people inside Syria. It is hard scrabble, insufficient, woefully insufficient. And civilians are dying now at very, very high numbers. We're not sure what the numbers are. When you don't know the numbers, you can tell that there's a level of chaos and blocked access. And that's the situation now. We actually don't know what's going on. But what we do know is that people are now fleeing in vast numbers from Syria. They're getting out anywhere they can because it's now intendable to live in that country. And even refugees who are in the camps in Lebanon and Jordan and elsewhere, they are leaving because the international community has not funded the UN nearly to the level that the UN needs to provide services in the camps. So it's now at 41% of the of AS need, the international response. It's, it, the World Food Program has halved its food rations for people in the camps in um, Lebanon and Jordan. The, Uni the United States has contributed generously, it has, um, but other countries must step up. And now what is happening is that the people are coming from this war-torn region um, into Europe in hopes of safety. And then, as Carl was saying, there are other populations that are joining them, desperate Afghans, because the war is chronic and not working. Iraq, where the war is chronic and not working for safety for the civilians. And anticipation of either further violence in both of those countries. And from North Africa, people are coming because governments have collapsed, there are wars going on, high insecurity, and livelihoods are essentially insufficient. Uh, climate change has produced drought and difficult conditions for farming in many parts of North Africa. So this is coming together in a way that is overwhelming our coping strategies as a world and as the developed North and West. And it needs to be seen as a calamity of the highest proportions. We require the best minds and the most principled actors to mobilize and uh, come up with a reasonable set of solutions. Some of them, which as Carl said, may have to be out of the box. Some of them may be outside the architecture that we thought was sufficient. Um, <clears throat> Jennifer, we were here, I believe I was here with you two years ago when, when this was um, just a crisis in camps, right? Um, we, were, we were talking about the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who were swarming into Jordan, to Turkey, to Lebanon, um, and, and stay, at that point staying there. Um, I, I guess I wonder what happened in, in the two years. Did, did Jackie Baba, did we not see this coming? 
Was there just no way to think outside the box in these last two years? I think we largely didn't choose to see this coming. I think, um, as we've seen with other massive refugee crises in the past, when refugees don't arrive on your doorstep, you don't really worry about it. So a larger number than the Syrian refugees were the Iraqi and the Afghani refugees uh, in the 90s. But they didn't really make it to Europe. They ended up in Pakistan and in Iran. and so. It was really more out of sight, out of mind. And I think we could have anticipated this much earlier. We could have had much more generous refugee resettlement programs. So making it lawful and safe for people to leave war-torn areas rather than forcing them onto the perilous uh, waters of the Mediterranean where so many, over 2,500 or alone this year, have drowned. We could have anticipated this by making much better provision in the refugee camps in the surrounding neighborhoods so that there wasn't a situation like the one Jennifer describes where there isn't enough food, where children at age five and six are working, something that the FXB Center documented two years ago. So we could have seen this coming, but we really chose not to. We chose to simply fortify our borders and um, bemoan the lack of a reasonable solution in Syria. Um, and I think that this is really, as I see it, the big crisis we have now. I think I agree with Carl that um, the situation facing Germany is extreme. What is very regrettable is that other European countries, and I would actually say the United States too, are not stepping up to the plate adequately. My own country, the UK, has taken a paltry 2,400 Syrian refugees. Turkey has 1.7 million. There's something unconscionable about that. The US so far has agreed to up its resettlement quota by a figure of 10,000. Not all of that 10,000 will go to Syrian refugees, but presumably quite a number will. But 10,000 extra, that seems to me to be a paltry figure when you have a situation like this where 50% of the country is facing death and trauma, which will have lifelong legacies. So I guess my point really is, Aaron, that um, we could have seen this coming. We could have done more, and we should be doing more. We have in place um, an architecture which doesn't v work very well, but we're making it work less well than it could. We have obligations to refugees, which we should be processing much more speedily. It, it's un intolerable that people with small children should still be taking to these fragile vessels and drowning on the Mediterranean, that little children, as we've seen, you know, arrive on, on beaches dead. Um, but they do that because there aren't other exit options. And now we see this dreadful uh, prospect of fences erecting themselves between EU member states. It's the first time this has happened, that the area of free movement in Europe is becoming an area now fortified by barbed wire. It's quite terrifying. So I do not in any way want to minimize the enormous challenge, logistical, humanitarian, and political. And I don't want to minimize the wonderful outpouring of humanitarian compassion that there's been from Angela Merkel downwards. I think it's something that Germans rightly can celebrate and be proud of, if only other European countries could follow that example. But I do think that there isn't a fixed number that we can take. I do think that there is room to think creatively, there are spaces. We are enormously rich in the developed world. We have enormous resources. And I think that this is the time to really see some of the re uh, responsibilities that come with our wealth and our relative privilege. You know, we in the media like, uh, like markers, biggest, best, fastest, that sort of thing. And, and but this comes from the United Nations, right? This, uh, the, the fact that this is the biggest refugee and migration crisis since World War II. Uh, it, it always makes me wonder what the difference is between this migration and that migration. Why were we able to deal with it then? Was it a homogeneity of the people who were moving around? Uh, I mean, I, I would say that there's a concurrence of various different migrations. So as I said, the number of Syrians is actually not greater than the number of Afghans. 
but we have other migration flows in other parts of the world which compound this one. So if you look at what's happening in the Middle East and you look what's happening in Southeast Asia and you look at what's been happening in Central America, then you have many different forced migration situations which are coming together. So what I would say is that um, this is a, a geopolitical problem. It's not really just localized in one place. And so the confluence of many different um, crises and wars, as, as Jennifer mentioned, has brought us to a point where we now are facing this enormous, um, this enormous set of challenges. It's kind of the, the perfect storm. Yeah. But okay. it's, it's also a matter of, of sheer numbers. When you have 10,000 a day, just, just think about it, you know, of exhausted people coming in and you have to distribute them over the country every day another 10,000 and that goes on now for several months. That's a crisis we never had. But one shouldn't think that there was a humanitarian response of tremendous significance in Europe right after World War II. There were militaries, allied militaries. There was an occupation. There was structure. And then finally, but you know, two years later, two and a half years later, the Marshall Plan started to roll money in. But during that first two years, it was very, very difficult. People starved. People died of dehydration and exposure. People were trying to go back to places and they couldn't because there was still hostility towards who they were. Some people were forcibly sent back to the Soviet Union and were killed because they were considered suspicious. It was, it was a very, very difficult time filled with uh, tremendous volunteerism, tremendous discipline on the part of the Allied militaries. Uh, but but people were in camps in terrible situations up until the early 50s before they could come to the United States. So, the, um, and it was, even though it was a diverse group, it was more homogenous than this group because of what we've been saying. Well, I'm glad we got to that because we are going to move on um, to solutions. What happens next? We've laid out the problem um, and the four people here and Simon will, uh, three people here and Simon are going to solve this crisis in the next uh, 35 minutes. You'll be happy to know. Um, f first, I, I want to start with uh, another video, and, and this looks at um, a situation in Germany, which, as we've heard, is dealing with uh, a lot of migrants, 10,000 a day in some cases, and refugees. Um, this is a video also from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, and it looks at some of the response in Germany. A city and its citizens mobilizing for a happy influx. Munich, Sunday, and volunteers and officials prepared to welcome thousands of refugees. They were there to show their solidarity and pleasure at the refugees' arrival. Ich bin selber aus München und mir ist es ganz wichtig, wirklich den Menschen gleich am Anfang das Gefühl zu geben, ihr seid willkommen. Wir freuen uns, dass ihr es geschafft habt, hierher zu kommen. The train had come from the Kelly station in Budapest carrying 300 refugees, most from Syria. As the new arrivals stepped onto the platform, they were greeted by signs in Arabic saying welcome. Their joy was apparent in their faces and their gestures. They waved happily to the volunteers and officials waiting for them. I feel good and uh, I feel... Uh, <laughs> I'm breathing finally. The good feeling was shared by the waiting crowd. The applause was followed by gifts, sweets for the children, clothes for the family. The donations outstripped the need. After the joy, the checks. Volunteers helped escort the refugees to the tent where they would be given a quick medical examination to see how they had weathered their long trek. For many, the memory of their journey was still painful. So, uh, Simon Henshaw, we see the, the smiles, the joy on people's faces there when they get to Munich. Is that it? Are they home free now? You, know, you see the smiles on their faces, and uh, it just reminds you of the importance that we need to keep borders open for refugees and allow them to come in. We need to avoid these horrible situations of people being forced to flee across seas and oceans in incredibly dangerous situations. 
So we need to do both. We need to make sure that both we're open on one side and we increase our support for those still in the region. I think we need, we need to remember that it, this is the biggest crisis since World War II, the biggest refugee crisis, but it, it's not the European refugee crisis, which is the biggest. It's the worldwide crisis, which is the biggest. Sixty million people are displaced or refugees, and that's because we've entered an era where crises begin but don't end. You know, in, in the past, we've had similar crises in Africa in Asia and Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan, six million of eight million refugees have returned to Afghanistan. But since then, we've had a series of crises, Africa, South Sudan, CAR, Syria, others, which are not ending. And that's severely straining the humanitarian system. What we need is, is more funding. We just don't have enough money to deal with the issues right now. The Europeans uh, have uh, 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 pledged more money. They're great contributors. The U.S., as I said, has contributed $4.5 billion in humanitarian aid since the beginning of the crisis. But this is simply not enough given the numbers, and that is what is calling, uh, causing the current flow towards Europe. Um, I, I did want to just make a couple points as well. Um, as we look for solutions, it's important to remember that there's a difference between refugees and migrants. Migrants are people that are leaving their countries because there's no longer a, a livelihood or an opportunity or a way of life available for them, and they want to go and look for work somewhere else, and they're faced with a system where much of the first world is walled off to them. Refugees would be happy to go back to their country if, if violence uh, ended, which is why the current refugee system is geared towards keeping people relatively close to the, to the area of crisis so they can go back once the war is over. They, under the international system, have the right to cross frontiers and be accepted into uh, other countries. Migrants do not. And that's, that's an important difference to remember. And one of the things that is causing the current crisis is there is no way, no orderly way in which to deal with the large number of migrants which are involved in this. I also want to point out that most refugees in the world are not in camps. About three-quarters of them live in urban areas or non-camp settings, and that's true in the Middle East. No refugees in Lebanon are in camps. Only about 15% in, uh, in uh, Jordan and about the same in Turkey. So you have a very difficult situation and a different situation than in the past where the services that people need are different because they're not organized in a single location. They're spread out amongst the city. So you have to look at not only providing them services, but also making sure that countries where they live set up systems where they can survive, where there's education provided and work provided. I, I, I think it's important to remember we are doing a lot. Uh, uh, through UNICEF, with U.S. and other money, 100,000 kids are going to school in Lebanon, thanks to the Lebanese sharing their schools. 120,000 in, uh, in uh, Jordan are going to school. Much more difficult situation in Turkey because of the language barrier. But next week, we will be inaugurating our 13th UNICEF school, which is dedicated solely to educating um, Syrian children. And last point, um, work is so important. If, if refugees are given the right to work in the countries to which they first flee, they have a chance of supporting their families. They're also much, much, much more likely not to send their kids out to beg or to, or to work. And so the, the, more that, the more chances that adults have to work, the, less, uh, the more children that you will see in school. Simon, you're making me think we may not solve this by the end of the, the program today. <laughs> um, well, I've been working on it two and a half years, and I still haven't figured it out. Um, Jackie Baba, Simon mentioned some of the, the great programs that are going on um, funded by the U.S. and others. Uh, I, I wonder if part of the problem is that there isn't a unified strategy. It seems to be um, a lot of NGOs doing their thing, a lot of governments doing their thing individually, but no sort of overarching, there is no Marshall Plan, I guess. Um, I think that's a good point. I think. Uh, Simon's absolutely right that you need a multifaceted set of responses. I mean, first and foremost, I suppose it's so obvious it goes without saying, 
you need to address the war, you need to address the conflict, because people would much rather stay at home. So if there's even a prospect, I think, of peace, people's urge to, to leave will decrease. And I think at the same time, if people have a sense that there is still the possibility of safety, they're less likely to flood in than if they see you know, barbed wire gates going up, which gives people a sense of panic. And so we've seen this again and again. But beyond that, yes, you're right, we do need a much more integrated set of approaches. And I already mentioned the failure of so-called burden sharing, that some countries in Europe, it's really Germany and Sweden, are taking the disproportionate uh, share of people, whereas other countries who could do more are not. Um, I think we also need to think much more systemically about how you really integrate populations who want to work. People are not coming because they want to get a free ride. People are coming because they want a future and they want to contribute. And so that's a massive area of necessary investment, thinking about skill training, language training, job training, job creation. So those are all imperatives, I think, if we're going to avoid a, a, a real meltdown with, with these large populations. In terms of integration, I think the European Union has been unable to deliver because, um, and Carl will probably know this better than me, but my sense is that there just are such different political drivers between the EU member states that it's very hard to get a unified response. So even though you have, in theory, a area of border free travel. In practice, you have on the one hand, Germany, we saw the response, you know, welcoming in the opportunity to be generous. And on the other hand, Hungary saying we're a Christian country, we don't want non Christians, we can't cope with these people. They're both EU member states. So how do you get a unified approach when you have such diametrically opposed views? I think it's a real challenge. And that's one of the real disappointments and the problems I think that we're facing in Europe at the moment. Well, Jennifer, if we put the potentially racist issue aside, we're a Christian country. Um, aren't these countries um, correct in, in being nervous about an influx of what will likely be low-income workers? And Hungary's economy is not what Germany's is. Um, and, and, and those people are not going to stop coming, right, from, from the countries where the economies are, are not doing very well. Yes, I, I mean, the, the distinction between migrants and refugees <clears throat> may be one of the things that has to change. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, and, and that would involve um, either revising the Refugee Convention or doing something outside, because revising any treaty is very difficult. Uh, but the, the point is that many of these people that are termed migrants who are coming from um, parts of Africa and uh, actually are coming from areas that have been deeply disturbed by war. So they are finding it impossible to make a living. So even if there's no war now? Yes, so they are survival migrants. And at a certain point of extremity, um, do we say you individually have to show that you're being specifically persecuted because of who you are according to the categories of the Refugee Convention before we deem you a refugee? Or do we say actually you are coming from a country that is increasingly unable to provide for your safety and livelihoods. Your family is starving. Your kids are going to die. You have to get out to live. You know, it's a, it starts being, you know, how many um, people can dance on the head of a pin. In, in other words, the distinctions with enormous differences. <clears throat> so what I'm, what I'm suggesting is we need to look at this more holistically. And many of the people, as Jackie was saying, who are coming in under the refugee uh, side of things are young um, or they're young members of the family and they are eager to build new lives, to learn the languages and work. Europe is an aging population and in general, they need people coming in they will train them. Germany already is starting to train people in sort of the trades that will then work within the German economy. This should be a high priority for all of the countries in Europe. But uh, what I would like to say is that um, UNHCR, in addition to all of the hard work it does now, uh, is probably going to need to be helpful to the nation states in Europe in terms of how you deal with difference and how you take care of refugees or migrants who may have come in, in these large fairgrounds and the halls and other places where, where they are being um, held as humanely as possible. But there is a, there are protocols of humanitarian response that you can't expect the mayor of Munich to know. And so the German Red Cross working with UNHCR should be there to help 
figure out the relative numbers of latrines and positions of uh, water stations, et cetera, so that people can, the town can manage these tens of thousands. And then one other point I would like to make about this is that the, the Afghan and Iraqi refugees, they need to be called refugees because they are in a war zone that is active. So that's why these distinctions, um, to me, are um, playing into a status quo that Jackie has um, uh, eloquently identified as completely unacceptable. So Carl Kaiser, I, I wonder why it is that we can't, I mean, you've just said it right here, why can't we convince these countries that refugees, migrants, whatever, whatever you want to call them, are actually going to be better for their country in the long run? What, where, where's, the, yeah. but where's the block? Between the long run and the short run, there's phenomenal difference. <laughs> you know, when, when a city like Berlin has to take in 100,000 people, uh, not speaking the language, speaking a little English here and there, uh, totally traumatized with it, without anything, uh, just their clothes, um, from there to integrating them in the economy is a long, long way. It takes a long time. Uh, yes, it is true, actually. German business says we are, we are with it. We see a chance. But that, that, that takes an enormous amount of time. And the sheer financial burden is, is uh, extraordinary. Uh, each, each person, for example, every day, uh, every month gets $150. Uh, clothes, medical treatment, the children have to be taken care of. When they stay longer, they go into the welfare system because these are welfare states. I mean, European states, what well, Americans usually don't know, are welfare states. And uh, after a while, you get into the welfare system, but that means four, five hundred dollars a month. Well, multiply that by hundreds of thousands or millions, then you see the financial burdens. Now, you would, uh, you can argue Germany can afford it for a while, yes. But the real problem is the infrastructure. The infrastructure isn't there to deal with such large numbers. For the time, meaning, for the time being, it's, um, it's uh, volunteers that, that take care of it. And for the time being, yes, the atmosphere is welcoming, what we've seen in the movie. But will it last? Will it last? I mean, the, Germany has only a small uh, anti-foreign movement, not even 5%. France has a very large one, the Front National. Uh, um, it will increase, no doubt. Soon you will see other pictures, not the welcoming one, but um, um, a refugee home burning. Uh, and, and it will be a big, big problem. And I, I, I know from talking to people in Berlin this morning, they are very worried, what will we do in a month or two or three months uh, when the capacity is filled to 100%? Uh, Here is the convention. You have to deal with everybody who comes in, but there's no room anymore. Now, theoretically, of course, in a country of 80 million, you should be able to take in 2 million. But physically to do it is very, very hard. And the others don't do well, much. I mean, one know. thing about Europe, yeah. the 50 million in Europe after World War II and the 60 million now. They is that, come from somewhere. Well, no, but, yeah, the, but, but, they, they, but they Europe was in shambles. So the, this idea of where you put people was an irrelevant question because nobody had a home. Yeah. Certain, certain, and here you've got stability that is now being right. actually challenged to become more flexible. And it was different in the sense that the four million Germans, for example, who went from, from east to west were Germans, yeah. you see. And here you have very different people. And what we tend to forget is we speak about the Syrians. Um, the, the Africans, don't forget the Africans, yeah. they're coming also for, through the Mediterranean. Uh, and that's a, a totally different group again, because the Syrians are relatively educated. I, we're going to go to questions in just a few minutes. I, I want to get from each of you very quickly, mm -hmm. um, what's the first thing we do? Just the very first thing tomorrow, we if you could, yes, mean, if you we should could wave do. a wand tomorrow, what happens? One well, thing. it's dawning now on the European governments. It's definitely visible in the European Union and also in, in what the German government is doing at the moment. We have to shift the entire emphasis of what we do to the countries that are in crisis or the neighboring countries. Uh, Erdogan, the Turkish prime minister, uh, president, was in Brussels yesterday. We have to convince the Turks to do more and we have to help them to do more so that people stay. The one idea is to declare Turkey a safe country so that the Greeks can return them. But that would only work if they have a place to return to in Turkey. 
meaning proper conditions. The, the European Union has, and some countries have now voted large funds to be given to those countries. But that can only be the beginning. Plus the fact that you have to do the same thing in, in, in Africa. Right. I mean, the sheer order of magnitude of, of help that is necessary to alleviate the situation is enormous. So that's, it's bolster the neighbors is the first yes. step. Yeah. Jennifer. <coughs> You get one thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, then I would say the first thing is a long-term idea, which is to recognize mm -hmm. that once these wars start, they last for an extraordinarily long time and they destroy societies. Uh, whether you put refugees nearby or migrants nearby, they will not go home because for their lifespan, the wars are destabilizing their regions. And we need to develop now an agency, an international agreement, a set of policies and strategies that figure out how to intervene very early in the warning signs of a war and to help stabilize that country so people can stay home. And this is what infuriates the humanitarian community, which is we, I say I am part of it, we are always trying to play catch up with catastrophe that has been allowed to get out of control somewhere. So my first thing is to start planning for what we must do better over the next five and 10 years. So it's like when there's a wildfire somewhere, everyone knows what to do because they've dealt with wildfires everywhere. Jackie? No, no. my point is, that they, is figuring out how to stop wildfires. Before they start. Before they start. Wow. Sorry. No, it's not. It's not a. Uh, it's not a ridiculous idea. Mm -hmm. We have all sorts of ways of intervening to strengthen governments, strengthen economies, improve uh, divisions among people. State Department does it all the time, and I think this is sort of what we need to redouble our efforts at. Okay, Jackie. One thing. I think we should massively increase our resettlement programs. And I think each of us should start in our own home. We're in Boston. I think we should get American cities to develop a very large scale sister city movement like has happened before. Mm -hmm. I think that we should see these very much as people like us. Many of the people who are coming are as educated as we are. Their children are as needy as our children are. So, and I think this is actually true of many of the African refugees too. They have, you, you meet them all the time driving you around in a cab, you know, they have college degrees. A lot of these, and it's always been the case, a lot of the refugees are the most educated, the most entrepreneurial, the most smart amongst their, amongst their cohorts. So I think that, of course, we need to solve the wars, and I quite agree. We need to be much more generous to the neighboring countries, and I do very much agree with Jennifer. We need to have early warning systems and much better prevention. But now that we have this crisis and we have no foreseeable end in sight, Personally, I am not con convinced about this, you know, we can't fit anymore. I think we need to jolly well step up to the plate and increase the resettlement quotas in countries that have so far really just only worried about the political fallout of having foreigners. And I think this is a, a, a task that citizens face as much as, as political leaders. Simon? I can't give you one, uh, give you four. <laughs> oh. We need to, that's cheating. We need to end the war now. Okay. Which one? It's it's the the Syrian war. That's that's the cause. Assad is the cause of this. Uh, we need to increase support to the region so that people are are safe and secure in the region. Um, we need to do something about how we how we work with migrants around the world. I would not want to make them the same as refugees. Refugees have a special status. It's worked really well, that part of it, since the end of World War II. They have certain rights because they're fleeing violence, and they should keep that. But the world needs to look at how it deals with the migrant issue as well in a similar fashion, if not the same. And very finally, uh, finally uh, uh, just a word on resettlement. We should look at the resettlement process, but I think it's important to remember that resettlement is only set, has only dealt with 1% of refugees in the, in the modern era. The idea is keeping refugees in the area so that they can return to their country once the war is over. Uh, the United States uh, settles more than all, resettles more than all other countries combined when it comes to refugees. And that's uh, the last three years been 70,000 a year. It's going up to 100,000 over the next two years. 
uh, 10,000 Syrians at least this year, more next year. But that's still a small number compared with those uh, in the region. And that's why we need to keep our focus on those in the region, giving them the support that they need to survive until this war ends. Thank you, Simon. So we've been having questions come in online. And Lisa, we'll, we'll get to a few of those. Thanks, Aaron. Oops, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm just going to take a few here. Uh, let's start with this one. What do you think are the most urgent health care needs of the refugees coming to Europe? I can tell you a little from dealing with refugees in Turkey and, and Lebanon uh, and uh, Jordan, many of whom I've met myself. Uh, the most urgent need is, is mental, uh, mental care. Uh, people have gone through real horrors and trauma, and they need, they need help. It's been a real struggle to get that to, to people in the surrounding, in the country surrounding Syria. I would say, Lisa, if I could just add to that, I completely agree with you, Simon. I would also say that there are some relatively low-hanging fruits that we could be delivering much better. We could organize doctors, volunteer doctors, like the people we've been seeing on the screen, to provide obstetric care. We shouldn't have people delivering without care in Europe, which we see constantly happening. We should be able to have children occupied so that the trauma on them and on their parents is decreased. I think these sort of simple things are actually perfectly doable. On top of that, of course, we know that the Syrian conflict has led to enormous health needs for chronic illnesses where people haven't been able to get medicines. And that's something, again, that European countries can do. But I think this is where leadership really could come in and you could galvanize resources that are, are around to, to much better address this than we have so far. Just one addition. Yes, I, I agree with uh, what Simon and Jackie have said. And uh, in addition, would suggest that there may be a difference in the health needs of the people who have um, gone through and endured this exodus uh, as compared to the people who are in the region and have moved a shorter period of time. Definitely, they will have significant mental health needs. Uh, but there may be a distinction in, in terms of the, the level of uh, anxiety and stress that we see. Uh, it is also going to be very difficult to do um, adequate mental health assessment with these numbers we're talking about, both in the region as, as well as in the, um, the, along the Trail of Tears, really, and then at the settlement areas where they're coming, um, as in Germany. Uh, so this is a sort of situation where you have, I think, a need for uh, trained volunteers from the, the regions wherever we are finding the refugees for any length of time, trained volunteers to be able to assess what is um, baseline and difficult mental health and also identify the people who are acutely in need of actual medical management for their post-traumatic stress or deep depression or high levels of anxiety. So the baseline being they are fairly healthy from a medical standpoint in addition to the chronic disease that will need to be worked out. But the mental health one is gonna require a very good strategy of community mental health and then acute medical mental health. Thank you. That, that's very interesting. Thank you. I'll take another one from online here, and there are a lot going in, so you can see them all in our live chat. Um, this is from Catherine Mollet, a journalist. On Syrian refugees crossing into Europe, most front page photos show young men in jubilation. How does that gender portrait reconcile with both known refugee demographic distributions in host countries encircling Syria and with IDP age and gender demographic populations inside Syria proper? Which is a very interesting question. If I could just say, we know traditionally that about um, 80% of refugees worldwide stay in the region, and those tend to be disproportionately women and children. Mm -hmm. Those who travel tend to be disproportionately men, often young men. So of course we've all seen pictures of women and children too, but it's nothing new for a ref refugee flow to have many more men and young men uh, traveling f further afield. You know, like the boy who said he misses his family, that's very often a common picture. So the camps will have larger numbers of women and children, and the migrants or the refugees crossing seas and crossing continents will be disproportionately male. That's, I think, always the pattern. 
Could, could I just say, though, that, that there's an ascertainment issue here, that what we're looking at the photographs of people that are charging the trains, charging the barbed wires, the vanguard, and the men will be there, and the women and children may be hanging back. So the numbers uh, are going to have to come forward from UNHCR or from the governments that are now screening the refugees who have traveled. Uh, I mean, the point that Jackie's making is the fundamental point, but there but, may be yeah. a mixture that we're not seeing. But I still think uh, it's a valid point. The majority are young men. And that has something to do with the fact, A, they want to avoid the draft in, in Syria. They don't want to fight for Bashar al-Assad. Secondly, in many cases, the families put together their money to pay one son to, to go pay the trafficker and make his way to Europe. And then hopefully one day he will bring yeah. the family back reunification of the family is basically is a basic right once you have been accepted as a refugee and you have asylum you have the status as such um, which means that if you have a hundred thousand young men you will end up with 300 to 400,000 a few years later and that has been the experience of the European countries for example with regard to to other kinds of immigration thank you, you. try one more question Yes, I think can we, we can take one from the audience here if anyone has a question. My name is Hesu Kim. Uh, I absolutely agree with what uh, you are saying, and I support the idea of international community should make a collective effort to help these people. Uh, but I have a question about the German side of view. Some Germans raise concern uh, about not only the uh, financial burden, but the safety of their own people. Some uh, people, some Germans think that uh, the influx of ISIS through the stream of these, these refugees, <coughs> and even uh, some Germans say that they have already received a flyer from ISIS, joining the ISIS. So could you comment on this uh, safety issue of the, these countries? Well. There is a presidential candidate in this country who has turned this into a big issue. Um, no, um, this is not a major t topic in Germany. W what you've seen there is the prevailing mood. It's welcoming, it's supporting all the mayors all over the country. Every city takes in people uh, from, you know, 1,000 to 5,000 to 10,000, Berlin 100,000. Um, yes, there is an anti-foreign movement, the PEGIDA. They organize, particularly interestingly, in the formerly communist part of Germany. And in, in, in Dresden, there was a demonstration only this last weekend. They are still around, and they will say this sort of thing, but that's not the prevailing mood of the country. And uh, uh, th this is the kind of argument you will hear from the Front National in, 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 in France, from the uh, anti-foreign movement in Denmark, and uh, from the UKIP in, in Britain. It's all over the place. It's, uh, uh, but if ISIS really wants to place fighters, that's not the way to do it in any case. You, ISIS will fly people in. They won't put them on, on rafts. Is what you can't saying. do it this way. I, I don't think so. Thank you. I think I'll just ask one more from online because there are a lot of people sending questions in. And this can be our last one. How can we incentivize countries more to support asylum efforts? The recently approved Europe European plan requires member states to accept more refugees. But do these countries receive any funds to do so? C can I answer that? Yes, the European Union, when it decided to distribute these 120,000, did actually decide that as receiving country gets a certain sum of money, I forgot how much it was, a substantial sum of money per head. It's useful, but it doesn't solve the problem because the larger numbers are not covered by this. Those are the, 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 the flows of refugees that are coming in. And there, the receiving country has the burden, and that can be quite considerable. Thank you. Now, I, I may have uh, stolen the thunder a little earlier, but we're, we're about to wrap up. Um, and what I would like from each of you is, um, again, kind of short, a, a policy takeaway from our discussion today. Carl? Given the pull factor and the push factor, the crises which go on and are not going to be resolved easily, there will be a continued 
flow of large numbers of people coming to Europe. And I am afraid the, con the, the, the borders will be closed in some way or another, not as, crucial, as, as cruelly as the Hungarians did. And then the problem will be to deal, to, to, to deal with the incoming crowds in southern Europe. Uh, and a solution has to be found through a very massive program. First, to have the Greeks, the Italians, to some extent the Spaniards, uh, but to try and help to resettle them then to in the areas where they come. That requires an unprecedented effort that Europe has never done before. I think the uh, humanitarian NGOs and the humanitarian architecture of the UN need to be positioned to uh, provide help and safety for the people that are moving, including the medical carers they needed en route, uh, so that we don't have to rely on volunteers, that there should be NGOs that are actually stationed in Croatia, in Hungary, in every country, in adequate numbers that could help the local population manage the health, feeding, and, and shelter for the people. And I also believe that the humanitarian NGOs should be involved in advising the mayors of cities in Germany but elsewhere when there are more people being accepted in how to take care of refugees in that early phase which may last a couple of years because the humanitarians including UNHCR know this better than any other form of civil um, or governmental um, uh, set of agencies. Jackie Babo, a uh, policy takeaway? I think um, what we learn from this crisis is how critical leadership is in uh, a situation where we are in fact one world, how critical it is for leaders to have vision and to really pull with them the best instincts of their populations. And we've seen some great examples of that. So leadership uh, is really the ability to galvanize the resources you have to solve intractable problems, at least that's how I see it. And I think that's exactly what we need to build in a situation like this. So it's a, it's a challenge, it's difficult, but if you have the right leadership, then you can build on the better instincts and hopefully put at bay the worse instincts. Simon Henshaw, take away. We have to do everything we can so that no more children or anybody drown in the Mediterranean. And I think we do that by increasing our efforts to support the humanitarian system to support refugees, keep our borders open as open as possible, and have the world community take a new look at migrants and the migrant situation and find a better way to, to deal with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today on this forum. The conversation continues online, forum hsph.org. And uh, uh, lots of forums go on over the course of the year. The next one is Drug Pricing, Public Health Implications. That is Friday, October 23rd, also from 12.30 to 1.30. And it's also uh, available live on forumhsph.org. I want to thank Carl Kaiser, Jennifer Leaning, Jacqueline Baba, and Simon Henshaw joining us remotely. You look wonderful. Thank you. And thank thanks you. to everyone who's watched and who is here in our audience. Thank you.